This is An American Workplace, a podcast dedicated to rewatching and discussing NBC's beloved mockumentary series, The Office. My name is Chad Hopkins, and joining me as always is my good friend and co-host, Katie White. Katie, how are you doing this evening? I am well, Chad. What's up with you? Nothing much. It's a little bit dreary in Dallas today, a little cold, a little rainy, but uh, we're, we're muddling through. It's, it's, going, it's going fine. How about with you? Yeah, same here. We had a couple of snow flurries in New York. Nothing enough to be pretty or stick, just just annoying enough. I'm definitely ready for some nice weather. Um, but we're dig- we're uh, digging into season four now, so that's something to look forward to. Yeah, for sure. And uh, not to mention the huge boost in listeners that we've had over the past few days. Uh, the Office Isms Facebook page shared the show, and since then we've gotten about nearly 6,000 downloads into just the last uh, four or five days, which is absolutely crazy. We actually reached uh, number 118 at least in the TV film category on iTunes, which is also crazy because I've never had a podcast rank in iTunes before. So that's awesome. Yeah, we uh, are really excited for all of our new listeners. Hello. Uh, If you're starting with us where we are in the podcast or if you're starting with episode one either way you'll listen to this at some point i hope welcome good to have you um please don't hesitate to reach us on social media say hi um just yeah let us know that you're there or if you have any questions or feedback we would love to hear from you we'll give all of our contact information at the end of the show yeah we're by no means the authorities on the office so we'd love to hear from all of you out there who've some of uh, some of you, I'm sure, have watched it as many, if not more, times than we have. So uh, whether it's feedback or ideas or something to add or something to disagree with us about, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you. This is a, an interactive show as much as we can make it. So uh, do that. Drop a rating review for us on iTunes if you're liking the show, because as said, that's a huge way for us to help. It helps us climb the charts and be seen by more people. A little bit of housekeeping as far as this episode goes. Since the first four episodes of season four are double episodes, we're only going to talk about one at a time. I know, I know, but this means more episodes of An American Workplace for season four. So it's kind of a win-lose situation. Um, So for this episode, we will only be talking about Fun Run. And this does affect the numbering. This is a, a super tiny nitpicky thing, but it affects the numbering. So for example, this episode... Uh, Fun Run counts as episodes one and two because it's a double episode. And so when we get to local ad, which is technically the fifth episode, it's going to be labeled episode nine because each of the first four counts as two episodes. So that's just a nitpicky thing, but something for you all to be aware of when you look at the episode numbers. We we always label things 401, 402, stuff like that. This episode is 401, 402. Next episode over Dunder Mifflin Infinity will be 403, 404 etc. So tiny thing, just wanted to get it out of the way. But as Katie said, this will give us a little bit of longevity in season four. It'll make season four uh, about nine or 10 episodes of this show rather than just five or six when we double up. So uh, we're ultimately trying to cater to you, our listeners. So we hope you don't mind. And with that, let's go ahead and dive in. We are talking about Fun Run. It aired on September 27th of 2007, was directed and written by showrunner Greg Daniels. Season four starts off with a bang. Literally. Michael is pulling into the Dunder Mifflin parking lot and he hits Meredith with his car. When Meredith is at the hospital, it comes out that she could benefit from a rabies shot since she was bitten by a bat in the episode Business School. So Michael decides to, of course, hold a fun run for rabies, even though there is already a cure. He calls it the Michael Scott Dunder Mifflin Scranton Meredith Palmer Memorial Celebrity Rabies Awareness Pro-Am Fun Run Race for the Cure. (gasps) (laughs) Michael gets severely dehydrated and ends up in the hospital with Meredith, where she finally forgives him. That is a lot of words, and uh, not (laughs) most of them don't make sense. Uh, I don't know why he he decides to name it both after himself and after Meredith, uh, calling it a memorial run. And uh, she's not dead, so no need for memorial. Celebrities, I don't know if any celebrities involved, unless you want to get meta and call the actors celebrities, but I don't think they're aiming for that. And pro-am, I'm guessing the am is 
pro-American. Uh, I don't really know what Michael's mindset is for that, but uh, Race for the Cure, again, you, you said it, it's cured. So there, there's a whole lot of wrong with that title, uh, but that doesn't even happen until halfway through. So starting off, uh, Michael hits her with his car. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a a pretty abrupt start to season four, um, which I'm imagining watching this live as it's being (laughs) aired in 2007, you know, you've waited the whole summer for The Office to come back. And when it does, before the the, uh, opening credits roll, you see Meredith get hit by a car. So it's a pretty abrupt start, uh, which is always pretty funny. Michael's talking about how blessed his life is and how, uh, yeah, he didn't get the job at corporate like he had wanted, but hey, it's okay because he got domestic bliss. Instead, his uh, Jan made him breakfast, or at least she bought the milk, (laughs) Um, and she's passed out on the bed still in uh, sloppy fashion and will probably still be in bed for a few more hours, but hey, he's got domestic bliss, and uh, his, his life's great and sales are going well at the, the branch and all is hunky dory until he runs over Meredith. Um, so I, I was left questioning after all of this, is he actually happy? Is, is he actually satisfied with his situation or do you think he's just making more of his happiness than actually is. Obviously, I would think that is definitely the case regarding Jan. He even shows a little bit of hesitation when referring to her passed out on the bed. But do you think everything else is just him sort of putting on a face despite how much he wanted to get the job? Yes, absolutely. I think it's all um, convincing himself that he's happy, as you said, especially with Jan, but with the job as well. Um, There's a point in the episode where he says... He, he tries to convince us that he and Ryan are still equals in some way. Uh, yeah, Ryan got the, bo- got, got the job, but, you know, he's the, what does he say? He's a, he the is, small fish in a big pond. Right, but <laughs> I'm the top dog in a fairly large <laughs> pond as well. Yeah, they're so both still in tries, ponds for some reason. <laughs> right. <laughs> so who's the real boss, a fish or a dog? So he's trying to kind of level himself with, with Ryan and... Uh, I think he's definitely trying to make his situation seem a little bit better than it is. Now, despite the fact that he does hit Meredith with the car, I feel sorry for him because I honestly think this was a legitimate mistake. I mean, this could have happened to anybody there. He only really looked away from the the road in front of him for a split second, and that just happened to be the worst timing. And... Uh, he hit Meredith, and I, I like I said, I don't think it was extreme negligence on his part. It was just bad timing. Uh, that being said, this was Michael was the worst person this could have happened to, just because of his sort of reputation of incompetence among the others in the office. And they tease him about it. They talk about, hey, did you shoot this person, or did you? I, I don't know. I don't remember the exact uh, comparisons, but uh, he he tries to insist to Meredith that she forgive him in front of everyone when, when they go and visit as a complete office. It's the first of two times during this episode that they completely desert the office in order to do something relating to Meredith. And uh, she refuses. She says, I don't forgive you. You hit me with your car. My pelvis is cracked. I am sitting in the hospital because of you. Why should I forgive you? Uh, so, yeah, my, I, Michael's trying, and I, I feel bad for him. It's just it, it, bad timing. I feel bad for him in a way, too, and especially since he's trying really hard. I mean, he sets up this whole fun run. Granted, it's unnecessary and not for the reason she's actually in the hospital. She doesn't have rabies, probably. I mean, you know, chances of her having rabies are not great, but they're going to give her the shot anyway. But he wants to do something. He can't fix her hip, so maybe he can prevent her from getting rabies if he, you know, holds a ridiculous fun run. So... He's trying, um, and he, in his weird Michael way, thinks that not drinking water while running is kind of solidarity to people with rabies because they have a fear of water. So he tries to not drink water to, I don't know, stick it out with people who have rabies. Yeah, solidarity. (laughs) Solidarity, yeah. With his silly way of showing it, he is trying to help. It's not effective, but he is trying. So I, I feel bad for him. Um, but it's funny that you mentioned negligence because when he's on the phone with Ryan and he says that, 
um, he hits Meredith with his car. Ryan asks if it was an intentional. And Michael says, no, 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 I was just being negligent. <laughs> right. <laughs> so he, uh, he admits it. I mean, he, he definitely knows he's in the wrong, although it doesn't seem that way when he tries to tell the office that he hit Meredith um, right after the credits roll. He has that ridiculous, um, Meredith got hit by a car. The doctor tried everything that he could do, and she'll be fine. <laughs> and <laughs> I did happen to be in the car that hit her, and everyone, of course, knows he was driving the car. So pretty long, drawn-out way of telling them. Where I start to lose pity for him is when he starts to blame everything that's happening on this curse that he has invented. The first thing that sets off the curse is uh, Pam tried to access a celebrity sex tape, apparently, and crashed some of the computer hard drives in the office. Uh, So that was strike one. And then strike two, literally, was him striking Meredith with his car. And then strike three was Sprinkles dying. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, But... He says, okay, that's it. The office is cursed. Everything is going wrong and it is no longer my fault. Okay. This is when he decides it actually wasn't my fault. Yeah, I was negligent. Whatever. It's not my fault. It was because of the curse. I can blame this on this other external entity and no longer accept blame myself. And that's when I start to think, okay, Michael, you were better off when you were just owning up to your mistake. And... Once he finds out that it was kind of a good thing that Meredith went because of the possibility of rabies, then he's like, oh, wait, never mind. It was a good thing that I did it. It wasn't my fault, but it was a good thing that it was my fault because she might have gotten rabies without me. So he he goes, he flip flops on his responsibility and you can't really do that. You either have to own up to it or BS your way through it. And obviously the preferable path would be to own up to it, but he just can't stick to that because it's Michael Scott. Right. He sees a trend of misfortunes in the office that day and just capitalizes on, oh, it must be a curse. Uh, It couldn't just be a bad day. Um, And what was it, Chad, that finally broke the curse? Oh, yes, it it was that he cured Meredith of rabies, right? Right, right. The the whole notion that the the rabies was a possibility and she was able to be treated for it before anything happened. Curse is broken. (laughs) <laughs> right everything's fine her her hip is fine because she no longer has rabies <laughs> and he continues to play the hero uh by instituting this fun run uh he's trying to minimize the whole hit with the car part of the story and emphasize the potentially saved her from rabies part and then he blows it all out of proportion he treats it like a true marathon but this is a 5k people i mean i'm not a fast runner but i can run a 5k in half an hour if i don't stop uh and it it's so blown out of proportion. He chows down on fettuccine Alfredo, and then he denies himself water, which it, one or the other, Michael, you can't do both. <laughs> and, right. and he just absolutely destroys himself. He's running along, and towards the end, he's like, that, that fettuccine is just sitting like a rock in the pit of my stomach. He, he can't do anything because his body is completely working against him because he's tried to approach this like a professional runner gearing up for an actual marathon, which is much, much, much more extensive than this little pretty wimpy 5K that he's set up. Especially since I've heard of athletes carb loading, you know, the day or the week before a mm-hmm. marathon, but not four minutes before a marathon. <laughs> that, that's know, a good point, entire, too. <laughs> like pan of uh, fettuccine alfredo and then expect to run a good marathon it, you're gonna see that again it's i mean it's not gonna be pretty and it wasn't so no it even wasn't okay uh, really my last thing about michael uh is we get a huge sum up of his character during a talking head from him during this episode he says do i need to be liked absolutely not i like to be liked i enjoy being liked i have to be liked but it's not like a compulsive need to be liked like my need to be praised And I just thought to myself while watching tonight, man, doesn't that say it all? Isn't that Michael Scott in a nutshell? He doesn't need to be liked, but he has to be liked. And he needs to be praised. I've been wanting to reference this quote since we started this podcast. Every time we talk (laughs) about Michael and his just, oh, it's his character. It's that's Michael. Oh, very Michael. He hits the nail on the head. I mean, it's, that's exactly it. He defined his own character right there. Um, 
he absolutely does have to be liked. And he kind of knows that about himself, which he admits finally here. The other meteor part of the episode circles around Angela and Dwight. Um, Angela is struggling with sickness with her cat sprinkles. Uh, this episode and this season apparently are going to uh, re-emphasize the fact that Angela is a little bit of a crazy cat lady. Um, and Sprinkles is sick, and she wants to go home during lunch to take care of Sprinkles and give the diabetes medicine and apply the ointment and all this nonsense, um, which is it's admirable that she cares about her pet so much. But Pam sort of sticks to her guns and her honesty speak her mind policy and says, listen, you're the head of the party planning committee. And you need to be the one who heads up this money collection for flowers and taking everybody to visit Meredith in the hospital. Meredith says, okay, well, fine. Or Angela, sorry. Angela says, okay, well, fine. And gets Dwight to go and take care of Sprinkles for her. Because they're lovers. It seems like a pretty easy task for somebody you care about to take care of your pet for a lunch period. And... Dwight is not excited about it. <laughs> Angela is reading off this long list of things that have to be done for Sprinkles, and Dwight just looks absolutely disdainful, and things don't go well. No, Dwight gets to Angela's house, sees how sick the cat is, and I'm sure we'll discuss his intentions more, but decides that the cat is better off dead, and um, more or less puts the cat in the freezer. This he tells Angela that, you know, the cat had died and to preserve the cat, basically put it in the freezer until she gets home. Uh, what really ended up happening, it looks like, was he fed the cat antihistamines, uh, put the cat in the freezer and, you know, maybe the cat would just die peacefully, but that's not exactly what happened. The cat looks like maybe struggled and then died in the freezer, which, yikes. Um, so Angela is rightfully pretty peeved off there are two sort of viewpoints i see for dwight here one is that he has an obvious disdain for sprinkles he's disgusted by this elderly sickly cat uh shows no sorrow once the cat is gone and then the other alternative is that he does care because he's a farmer he works with animals on the regular and was mortified at the the poor quality of life that this cat was having and the fact that it required so much care in order to excuse me in order to survive that he thought it was the right thing to do by putting it out of its misery so i i can see both viewpoints angela definitely leads leans toward the former um because she's hurt this is her cat she's had a, had sprinkles for a long time assuming she's had her the entire 16 years of her life uh, but I, I just wanted to offer that, uh, opposing viewpoint that Dwight could have done it and in his eyes did do it out of compassion for the animal. I think I agree. I think I lean more towards the second where Dwight does care. Um, if not for Dwight's character, then for the integrity of the episode, because I think here, Michael and Dwight kind of parallel each other michael um goes about caring for meredith the wrong way i think dwight goes about handling the situation in the wrong way although i think he has good intentions um because we do see him really try i think to win angela back and to apologize and we see it in the next episode as well which i won't get into yet but he does feel bad I think about what happened and uh that he handled it the wrong way and I don't know I I want to side with him even though I like cats I've had cats that's horrible <laughs> I wouldn't want anybody mm -hmm. doing that but um I think he really did try to do what was right I think so too and like you alluded to we'll have more to say about that later when we get to our discussion topic uh, but then the other sort of piece of the puzzle is Jim and Pam. We did leave on quite a cliffhanger at the end of season three, where Jim asked Pam out on a date and she said yes. And so we don't really know at first where that went. Uh, both of them are sort of denying any sort of intimacy with each other. Uh, Jim says he's single and still looking. 
Uh, Pam says they went out for dinner a few times and she talked him through his breakup with Karen and she's just glad that they're good friends again. And Kevin is insistent that they are hooking up. (laughs) Um, And for a large part of the episode, they are sort of sticking to that, that they're not together and they're just the same old Jim and Pam, good friends that we knew in the office. But uh, the end of the first half ends with Pam having a a talking head voiceover combination where she's saying, you know, uh, you'll know when I'm in love with somebody. I I won't keep that a secret. You'll know. We'll know. And then while she's saying that, we see behind the scenes clips of the camera crew following Jim and Pam and they consolidated vehicles away from the office and kissed each other. And so it was pretty obvious at that point that they were hiding something and they were confronted with that footage, which I think is the first time in the show so far we've seen footage from the documentary in the show, if that makes sense. Um, Yeah, but I think you're right. But so, yeah, uh, they are together officially and it's going really great, according to them. They're just so cute. I mean, (laughs) when they when they tell the camera crew, yeah, we're dating. Um, they just cannot stop giggling. They're just blushing and all. It's just very cute. It's such huge, genuine, happy smiles. It is so great to see the two of them finally, finally together. I can only imagine watching this live as I didn't uh, when it was first airing and getting that emotional payoff of knowing that they're finally together and happy with each other and things are just going swell at this point. But keeping in mind that this is still a secret. Only the camera crew knows. Nobody in the office knows. Um, So they still have to sneak around a lot. And speaking of Kevin being super interested in whether or not they're hooking up or not, uh, we see a little bit of a change in Kevin this season compared to the previous seasons. And this is more like the Kevin we get for the rest of the run of the show. He's still just as... uh, Uh, not smart, I should say, Uh, but he's a little bit more enthusiastic about it and has a little bit more of a a characteristic manner of speech. Uh, And like I said, that that sticks with him throughout the rest of the show. So uh, Kevin's slightly different, but that's okay. Uh, I I love throughout the episode how he and Oscar are sort of teaming up, watching for signs that point to whether Jim and Pam are together or not. And, uh, Yeah, it's just a great little side bit. I've always enjoyed when accounting becomes a little team, which we see Oscar and Kevin do in this episode, um, because they do all sit in a clump together and, you know, the salesmen kind of become a team and the accountants become a team and the annex becomes a team. And it's just fun to see that realistic camaraderie of who would realistically be friends. You sit next to the same people every day you're going to become closer with those people. So it's neat to see that play out realistically. Yeah, they work together every day. So of course they should be friends and interact with each other a little bit more than the others. So that, that's great. Um, the last character that I wanted to mention is just a small thing uh, because Ryan is the boss man now. He took over Jan's position. And I just wanted to draw attention to one specific talking head where he talks about being called a wonderkind. And he says, I don't know what that means. Actually, I do know. I do know what that means. It's uh, someone very successful for their age, and I would bet Katie a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, that nobody calls him that, <laughs> but that it's something that yeah. he either came up with himself or, benefit of the doubt, one person said it once, and he latched onto it, in a way very much like Michael would if somebody called him something like a wonderkin. Michael may not know the definition of the word wonderkind, but he would be awfully proud of being called one. And that that's just what made me think of Ryan. He's got this weird beard now. And uh, yeah, I'm already not a fan of Boss Ryan. It's weird because Temp Ryan, once he kind of got a personality that we saw on the show um, as a Temp, I liked him. He was kind of playful and a little sarcastic and then as soon as he got that call from david wallace and he got that little grin on his face and that that was the end of season three right there in this episode and we'll see more of it in this season he his personality took a 180 i think and i mean 
I'm sure all this has been there. It's been hiding underneath, but he's a totally different character now. And uh, something that I had never seen in the previous seasons. This is a different guy. Yeah, there's a scene in the episode where Michael calls Ryan to ask for a little extra money for the for the fun run to to boost the numbers a little bit. And we get an extended version of that in the deleted scenes where Michael says, uh, you know, th- you're supposed to cut me some slack now that you're in corporate. That's how this relationship works. And Ryan says something about wasting time. And Michael says, you never would have said that. And Ryan says, yeah, I would have thought it, but now I can say it. And so we get a glimpse into sort of what Ryan has always been is he's, he's kept to himself and now he doesn't have to because he's the boss man. Yeah, it's always been under there. Just uh, it's surfacing now that he has a voice. So something to look out for a whole new Ryan. Uh, now, what about funny moments? Oh, this is such a funny episode, I think. Um, <laughs> I love when Meredith is in the hospital and first of all, Pam tries to be smart and say, you know, half the office go at one time, the other half go at the other time. That way, Meredith isn't totally overwhelmed by all these people coming to her bed. Michael decides, yes, everyone will go at once. And Meredith comments on how overwhelming that is. Michael manages to pull out Meredith's IV in her arm, um, which is bad enough. And then the nurse comes to put it back in. And Kevin doesn't know what to do, so he starts clapping for the nurse. (laughs) I love that small moment with Kevin. (laughs) (laughs) Like, she saved his life in a restaurant. She was, it was just, I don't know, really, he just thinks that she needs applause, which is pretty great. And then when they're about to leave, Kevin reaches out and uh, tries to fist bump Meredith, like a a goodbye fist bump. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Michael has several iconic Michael Scott quotes in this episode. Um, there's, as far as iconic ones goes, there's, guess what? I have flaws. What are they? Oh, I don't know. I sing in the shower. Sometimes I spend too much time volunteering. Occasionally I'll hit somebody with my car. So sue me. (laughs) There's that one. There's, I'm not superstitious, but I am a little stitious. (laughs) I've used that one. (laughs) Uh, and then a, a couple other funny ones. There's when he's talking to Ryan, he says, yes, it was on company property with company property. So double jeopardy. We're fine. <laughs> Ryan just says, I don't think you understand how jeopardy works. And Michael says, oh, I'm sorry. What is we're fine? <laughs> <laughs> um, Michael wants all the spectacle with the fun run. He really wants it to be a huge, you know, event. Right. So he gets a giant check which he wants made out to science and he wants a doctor to come, <laughs> you know, collect the check and presumably the doctor will put it in the right hands. Uh, they can't get a real doctor to come collect this check. So Jim suggests that they employ a nurse for hire, as it were, um, alluding to a stripper. So of course we get a return of Elizabeth, the stripper from the bachelor party. And Michael says, oh, it's really cool that you went back and got your degree. <laughs> He's so clueless. <laughs> <laughs> and Elizabeth just, you know, in this itty bitty nurse's, you know, costume with no practical uh, purpose for that co- for, for that actual nurse's outfit. Um, it's she's clearly a stripper, <laughs> clearly, yeah, clearly, <laughs> and it's it's just obvious that she's not a nurse. But Michael has no idea. Yeah, fun flashback to Benjamin Franklin from last season. Uh couple other michael scott quotes that i just i have to mention them there's when they visit meredith he says i hate hospitals in my mind they are associated with sickness no duh michael yeah (laughs) he's like for you know for me personally they're associated with sickness yes that's what hospitals are for to treat sickness (laughs) and then uh is there a god if not what are all the churches for and who is jesus dad and he says that like he's just checkmated an opponent in chess. Like, I have the answer here. Obviously, there's a God because there's churches and there's a Jesus and he has to have a dad. So, yeah, I got it. I figured it out. It, he's so, so dumb. There is also a moment where Pam knocks on Michael's door right before the fun oh, no. run and she hears come in. I hear come in. I don't know what Michael actually thinks he says, but... Pam hears come in, she goes in, and Michael's changing. And apparently, 
pretty naked. <laughs> so she sees him without any pants on. Um, this word gets back to Jan, who then confronts Pam at the fun run and says, I don't know what your deal is, but he's mine, so hands off. And Pam just absolutely, yes, he is yours. I do not want him at all. Please take him. <laughs> and uh, Jan is very jealous of Pam. So it was just funny that Jan thinks that Pam would be at all interested in Michael at all. Yeah, and regarding that same incident, Michael says, you don't know me, you've just seen my penis. <laughs> <laughs> um, the poster that Michael has put together for the fun run says 5,000 miles, which uh, exhibits a clear misunderstanding in what a 5K is. K is not for thousand in this circumstance, Michael. It is for kilometers. So only 3.11 miles, I believe, is a conversion. Uh, and. Pam pointed out this joke as she was on her way into his office and saw his penis. Jim has this talking head right after Michael admits that he hit Meredith with his car and says, you know, there was one day where Michael came in complaining about a speed bump on the highway. I wonder who he hit then. I, I wonder. <laughs> Yikes. Going back to the 5K, Michael didn't design the race very well. Uh, normally, <laughs> you would hope to end up back where you started but he made it essentially a line so they ended up five kilometers from the office they get to go back now <laughs> yeah my michael he, he's not built for planning things like these and uh no. <laughs> it shows I, I love how toby's the one who actually wins the race uh which fun toby moment michael and dwight try to prank toby with laxatives but Dwight gives him Imodium instead, which is basically the opposite. It alleviates stomach problems instead of causing them. So uh, Toby runs great, finishes first, gets to the end, says, where are we? And Mindy, or Mindy, yes, uh, Kelly is just looking at her phone and says, oh, I don't know, it's about 5K from the office. <laughs> uh, real casual. I think last one for me, um, immediately out of the gate, the whistle blows, or rather, isn't it a gun? Yeah, it... Dwight shoots off his revolver. <laughs> Dwight shoots a <laughs> revolver. I don't know if it's a blank or what, but there's an actual gun. Um, immediately out of the gate, Oscar, Creed, and Stanley hop in a cab and go to a bar. They are not at all interested in running this race. <laughs> um, and they come back in a reasonable amount of time, too. I think they, they do beat Michael, so no one knows. Creed has an extensive knowledge of painkillers. And uh, when he's listing them off to Meredith, trying to figure out what painkiller she's on, uh, the look his coworkers give him is so funny. Like, okay, there's clearly something deeper going on here. Uh, knowing Creed as we, the audience, do, we could probably assume some sort of drug sales or just 70s, I suppose, the 70s. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. But he, he knows a lot about those, those pain medications. Uh, he has his classic quote, I've been involved in a number of cults, both as a leader and a follower. You have more fun as a follower, but you make more money as a leader. Uh, so there's that one as well. Uh, he's apparently 81 years old, as he admits to Jan as he signs up for the race. He says, I want to be in the 75 and up division. She says, you're older than 75. And he says, 82, November 1st. So he's up there, assuming he's telling the truth about his age. Just a couple more. Sorry, I, I had a lot of these small, funny moments. Andy. It's a funny episode. <laughs> yeah. Andy is terrified of nipple chafing. And so he has <laughs> embarrassingly taken, coffin, uh, taken, taken cotton balls and taped them to his nipples uh, over his hairy chest. And they stick out awkwardly from the underneath his shirt. And even despite that and the weird looks he gets from people, he still ends up chafing his nipples. So it. At least his fears weren't unfounded, I suppose. <laughs> Lastly, for me, uh, Kevin moments. Just a couple small Kevin moments. When Pam approaches accounting and asks if they want to go visit Meredith, contribute money for flowers, he says, who's we, you and Jim? No, me, Stanley, and Phyllis so far. Oh, I bet Jim goes too. I haven't asked him yet. Oh, I bet you ask. I was planning on it. I bet you were. <laughs> Oscar just says, subtle. <laughs> He's trying so hard to make something out of this. And uh, he he has a later talking head where he says, you know, I guess they really aren't together right now. And if they won't get together now, then they never will. 
uh, it's just too perfect. And they're, they they go together like PB and J, Pam Beasley and Jim. And he is so disappointed that this is not a pairing that is happening right now because PB and J is just so perfect. <laughs> such a wasted opportunity <laughs> i love that realization because he totally doesn't do it on purpose and realizes it in the moment oh snap they are pb and j come on you have to get together now <laughs> <laughs> i do like that we get a little bit more personality out of kevin in this uh this season already and it's just the first episode so um a little bit more yeah a little bit more, more personality from him yeah he's just a little bit less monotonous on the whole he's a little less like eeyore and uh, I guess a little bit more like Eeyore on <laughs> medication. Uh, like, <laughs> uh, uh, goodness, I don't, I can't think of what medication it would be, like but something that makes Zoloft you excited. Or something. Yeah, 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 something that gives you a boost of energy. <laughs> Maybe Eeyore on caffeine, I suppose. There you go. <laughs> <Cup of> coffee. <laughs> uh, so, what about deleted scenes? We do have an extended, extended deleted scenes cut, about sixteen minutes on this episode. Yeah, I just chose a few favorites. Um, kind of a theme that we don't get at all in the actual episode, which I d- hadn't realized I was missing until I saw the deleted scenes, was knowing Kelly and knowing how just talkative Kelly can be, I'm surprised that we don't get any of her reactions to Ryan dumping her in the in the episode that aired. But we do get several deleted scenes about Kelly missing Ryan and being upset that that Ryan dumped her. So in one of them, Pam finds Kelly lying under her desk. Uh, There's candy wrappers all over the floor. And Toby reveals that um, Kelly has been so upset and she's been so upset that she can barely even talk or she she can't even talk, he says, and kind of grins his way through (laughs) that. He's just so excited that she is uh, finally quiet. Yeah, he tries so hard to hide the fact that he's overjoyed, but he is so happy that he finally has some peace and quiet. Uh, Michael asks in a talking head, is Ryan my boss? He's called the boss. He has the power over me that a boss has. So no, we're equals. I, I, I don't follow his logic there, but I guess I'm just going to have to trust him that yes, him and Ryan, his boss, are not actual boss employee relations. They are equals. I'll just have to ignore anything else. Although keeping in mind that Ryan has Jan's old job and Jan was his boss. So <laughs> yeah. Ryan should definitely be his boss, but he just does not see it that way. Probably because Ryan used to be the temp, uh, the lowest position in the office. And Michael just can't shake that kid, you know, feeling about him. And now he's his boss. Michael suggests that Meredith was drunk at 9 a.m. And it's her own fault. She was hit. And everyone's disgusted with him, understandably. Uh, like, how, how dare you insinuate and put the blame on Meredith rather than just accept it yourself? And it cuts over to Meredith in the hospital, and she says, no, you, you can't get drunk from Kahlua. It's coffee. It's a kind of coffee. <laughs> and so there was some truth to what Michael was saying after all. She was at least slightly inebriated because Kahlua is definitely alcoholic. It is definitely a liqueur, and you can get drunk from it. So... It Ultima- may taste like coffee. Yeah. But. Ultimately, there was some truth to what Michael was saying. Yes, he was still being negligent. He was still not watching the road. But the whole reason that he uh, he hit her in the first place may be a combination between negligence and drunkenness on her part. So uh, interesting sort of turn of events there. We have a scene of Michael in the conference room uh, also talking about God again, how, of course, there must be a God. But he doesn't think that God is black, he said. He thinks God is a mixture of all the colors in the spectrum, which is white. <laughs> so he's... That's such a I don't cop think out. He's, yeah, I don't think he's meaning to be um, racist, but he kind of is being racist by saying that God is white. Um, so clearly, I don't know. He's getting himself in a messy situation again. And we have Daryl in the conference room who just gives him a look we can all imagine. In that same extended conference room scene, uh, you know, Michael asked everybody about their religion and he gets to Oscar. And Oscar reveals that he used to be Catholic, but now he's more agnostic. And so he's 
probably more secular humanist. And Michael just reacts and says, man, that is disgusting. We have a secular humanist in here. And Oscar understandably questions Michael. We wouldn't expect Michael to know what a secular humanist is. And so Oscar does what he all would, we all would and say, do you even know what a secular humanist is? And Michael says, it's a philosophy which says people can improve their lives by using reason instead of religion or superstition. And we cut back over to Oscar and it was a correct answer. And Oscar just goes, oh, <laughs> and that's that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> there is one where Kevin, who is trying to prove that Jim and Pam are together, is kind of baiting Jim into this amazing girl who's a friend of Kevin's and just <laughs> painting up this amazing picture of this young you know, beautiful girl who loves mountain biking and she's just really funny and amazing and um, trying to get Kevin, tr trying to get Jim to say, oh, you know, I'm not really interested and eventually admitting that he's with Pam. But Jim, you know, holding his own says, yeah, yeah, I'd love to meet her. Uh, give me her phone number. And so we cut to Kevin just, oh, man, I have to find a, a beautiful 25 year old who's athletic and hilarious and has to be my friend <laughs> he's like sweating uh... bullets he's so nervous <laughs> like oh no what have i gotten myself into because <laughs> we know i mean Ke if kevin had the option to be with that girl he probably would be <laughs> she sounds great but uh he doesn't know anybody like that uh kelly has a talking head where she calls ryan incredibly immature and says a whole bunch of things about him, like he doesn't understand the rules of basketball, even though he pretends to when he's with other guys. And he has incredible body odor and he waxes his legs and he hates dogs and he hates kids. And also he's gay. <laughs> so she's just doing everything <laughs> under the sun, throwing everything at him to slander him because she's hurt that he broke up with her. We see um, Dwight again trying to cheer Angela up. He's I aming her. He's just trying to get her to forgive him. And then he has a talking head where he explains that his sorries, his apologies mean nothing to Angela. And he seems really hurt. Um, he, that's kind of where I got some of my reasoning for Dwight. I, I think he's trying. Um, but yeah, we see him kind of hurting during his apologies. He is really hurt. And there's one more deleted scene. It's the very last one of the real where he's talking about how he admires Meredith for forgiving Michael and how he admires people who are willing to forgive other people, which is very heavily hinting that he wishes Angela would forgive him because he is hurting. Um, he, he says at one point, I don't remember, I think it's a deleted scene as well. He says, I've, I'm, on, I'm with a woman right now and I can't see myself being with any other person. And he's talking with or talking about Angela. So he's very much in love with Angela. And this is just a bump in the road that doesn't look great for them at this point. I think the last one maybe for me is um, at the end of the episode that aired, we see Michael with a red lollipop when he's in the bed at the hospital. Uh, we learn where he got the lollipop. Apparently, Michael still sees his pediatrician. <laughs> um, Michael, who is probably in his, I mean, 40s, gets... Yeah, um, mid-40s or so. Yeah, gets a visit from the pediatrician, who is just this old man, because presumably Michael was a kid when this guy was also practicing. So um, he's, he's, he's up there. And on his way out, Michael says, hey, are you forgetting something? And the pediatrician is, oh, right. And he pulls out a lollipop and hands it to Michael. So, uh, I mean, I guess at least he's logic. But you know what that reminds me of? I don't know that you've watched Friends, Chad. I think we had this discussion. But for those of you that do, Ross still sees his pediatrician on Friends. So that might be a little throwback to, uh, to Friends. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Michael purely sees his pediatrician because of a lollipop. Like, right, he, yeah. <laughs> he went to an adult practitioner maybe once and thought, wait a second, I don't get a lollipop or uh, a Band-Aid with a cartoon character on it. <laughs> no way. I'm going back to the other right. place. <laughs> <laughs> it's like all the perks of going to the doctor. Yeah. Uh, which leads us into our discussion topic. And it's just further Dwight Angela discussion. What do we think 
Sprinkle's death means for Angela and Dwight's relationship. And obviously, both of us have seen this before. We know what happens. Uh, but second part of the question, how would you react if this scenario happened to you? Well, I mean, without giving things away, standing alone and looking at this episode, not good things for the relationship. I mean, if I was dating somebody who killed my cat, uh, sorry, <laughs> then you you might be out. Um, in fact, you almost definitely would be out. Um, it's just intentions being good or not, it's a really awful thing to do. Uh, and at least talk to Angela and say, hey, your cat's not doing well. Maybe consider putting it down. Or it, it's not his decision. It's not his choice to kill the cat. It's not his cat. Um, how would I react? I mean, yeah, uh, I'd have a hard time staying with the guy, that's for sure. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I've never been in that position, luckily, but uh, yeah, he'd probably have to go. I mean, that's the same answer I was leaning towards as well, is that where Dwight failed here is he didn't communicate his intentions. He didn't talk to Angela and give his reasons before he went through with it. He should have said, okay, listen, this is my experience with animals. This is what I've gone through. This is how we treat an animal who is clearly suffering. And it would be beneficial to Sprinkles to go out on a high note or whatever excuse he would give. He, he needed to communicate that to her rather than just mercy killing her cat without any communication whatsoever. And then trying to hide it and saying, yeah, Sprinkles was already dead. But then having all this evidence behind, like puke in the freezer and scratch marks and ripped bags of frozen vegetables. He just goes about it in the complete wrong way. Intentions, noble, good or not. He doesn't communicate with this girl who he claims to love. And that's the issue. There has to be communication. And so I think that if they were to break up because of this, it would be justified as much as they might find happiness in each other. Uh, pets are an important part of our lives. And Angela was very attached to this cat, had had this cat for a long, long time. And Dwight just snuffed it out. And it, it, it's the worst for their relationship. So yeah, probably if things had gone about the exact same way and I was in this relationship and somebody had killed my cat, I probably would have cut that relationship off or put some distance for a while. I don't know. Uh, again, like you said, it's hard to say exactly what we would do without being exactly in the situation. But if they had been handled a little bit differently, then I would have an easier time forgiving and understanding. I did get a laugh, though. We see a few pictures of sprinkles, um, particularly on Angela's shirt. And then there's a Halloween costume where they're both kittens. Um, I'll have to remember to post the picture to Twitter once this episode airs. But I think that the writers uh, or the director probably got a uh, kick out of picking just the most gnarly, mean looking <laughs> cat in the world. I love cats, uh, but that's just a that's a rough looking cat. <laughs> yeah. Um He's just mean looking. I'll have to remember to post that because it's pretty funny. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and with that, I think that's the end of the official 29th episode of An American Workplace. We are so close to 30 episodes. Uh, contact for the show, facebook.com slash workplace pod and at workplace pod on Twitter. Please, again, consider going over to iTunes, rating, reviewing, even subscribing. Big help to us. We'd love to climb those charts again. And if you have any feedback or ideas, you can email us at workplacepod at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter at ktlady623. Pretty active over there. Also on facebook.com slash katie.white. The best place to find me is at chadadada on Twitter. That is C-H-A-D-A-D-A-D-A. Also facebook.com slash chad.hopkins. And there is my other podcast, Cinescope, where we talk about the movies we love and why we love them. Most recently, we released two episodes, one over the new Liam Neeson movie, The Commuter, and one over the old Liam Neeson movie, The Grey. So if you like Liam Neeson, <laughs> go check those out, I suppose. <laughs> you can find that show where podcasts can be found and at thecinescopepodcast.com. Show notes and contact information for this show can be found at workplacepodcast.com. And that is all for this week. 
Thank you for joining us to watch one of our favorite shows, The Office, here on episode 29 of An American Workplace. Make sure to join us in episode 30 for our discussion on the next episode of season four, Dunder Mifflin Infinity. Goodbye. Goodbye.